Hi, Eric. Welcome to the Buy, Grow, Sell podcast. Uh, hi, Simon. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. No, I appreciate you making the time and, and very much looking forward to hearing your story. So um, um, now, Eric, obviously I've had the benefit of seeing a bit of your background and stuff like that, but maybe just to help kick things off for our listeners, maybe you could give us a little of your background and uh, and kind of what led you into, um, you know, ultimately, I think we're going to talk about your business, Stone Temple Consulting. So maybe you can just paint the picture up to that point and give us a give us an understanding of that background. Sure. I'll give you sort of the two minute drill um, that you're know, basically, uh, you know, engineer by background initially did that kind of work for a while, grew into managing uh, pseudo startup businesses within a larger company, did that. Uh, left there, started Stone Temple Consulting, which was a business development consulting business for a while, uh, which wasn't uh, what it was at the end, and uh, eventually got distracted for a while into running some small publishing companies and building those and actually uh, selling those. Uh, went back to Stone Temple uh, with a major focus on search engine optimization um, which became my career for 20 plus years. Um, and uh, that's what we built the, the real success story in uh, Stone Temple consulting around was search engine optimization. Yeah, yeah interesting, interesting. Um, you, you mentioned um, just prior about doing some sort of startup work, but inside larger firms. Um, I'm curious about that, like, as I... I you know, this debate of sort of what I might loosely call entrepreneurship versus intrapreneurship. Um, do, do you, what are your thoughts? I mean, do, do large companies, are they able to do this well? Do they struggle? Like what's, you know, what's the main differences there between doing it in a large firm and, and doing it for yourself? So um, the large firm is, well, will always have some sort of constraints that they're going to put on you that would not be in place if you were, um, you know, totally independent. Uh, it may be the timeline to profitability and, you know, how you get funded uh, um, is a common one. For example, there may be cultural restrictions, like you can't um, have uh, uh, a fun and fanciful brand because we are the, the very traditional and, and, and uh, dependable type brand. And, and so the, you know, these, these might be constraints that you have as uh, an entrepreneurship. Um, on the other hand, the process of selling your way into raising the money to fund the organization, in some cases, might be simpler, at least initially. Uh, but as I say, what comes with that is probably a shorter timeline to positive results. So... There's some trade-off. Yeah, 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 for sure. It makes sense. Um, and and didn't want to derail, but I was always always curious about that. I've you know I've worked in large corporates myself, and I've seen them stifle great ideas. But then again, sometimes having the backing of a large corporate entity can just accelerate things so well. So, yeah. <clears throat> as as many entrepreneurs would know when they get investment from large you know uh, funds as well. But um, so, so just for the, I guess, the uninitiated, I mean, I think most people understand what SEO stands for these days, but maybe could, could you just give us a quick overview of Stone Temple Consulting? Like, what is SEO? What are some of the services? Who are the typical clients you engaged? You know, that sort of stuff. Sure. So uh, search engine optimization is basically the practice of tuning your websites uh, so that they earn more of the free search traffic from search engines which we call organic search traffic. Uh, and so what many people don't realize is that uh, there, there's no library of editors that decides what shows up at the top of Google. It's all algorithmic, but it's designed to try and surface the best answers to the user questions in relation to a search query. But there are things you need to do to make your site something that the search engines and Google in particular, can actually properly read and discover what information you have, what information products and services you have, I should say. And, um, and then you also need to have an understanding of what things are, what 
phrases users are using to search for products or services similar to yours, or more precisely, what needs are they expressing which can be satisfied by your products and services? Um, and that's called keyword research, another part of SEL. Um, uh, and you know, it's kind of like figuring the language, figuring out the language they use. And if you need to know that language because that language needs to appear on the pages of your website. So Google can figure out that you're actually addressing those needs. So that was my best cut at a 90 second course. <laughs> no, that's very helpful. So uh, no, thank you for that. And and so t typically, who are the type of clients that, that you would normally target or work with? So we worked with uh, you know, a lot of larger companies, including a number of Fortune 100 uh, companies, but also in some cases, really well-funded uh, startups and things like that. So we really didn't work with the small business. So that, you know, uh, you know, like barbershops or, uh, you know, local retail stores or things like that. Um, but uh, uh, mostly, you know, somewhat larger firms and in some cases, some of the largest companies in the world. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I know <clears throat> having, um, once again, worked for large companies and also run a number of my own businesses. Um, I'm curious where you see SEO typically kicking in, because I know with smaller companies, <clears throat> excuse me, um, certainly in my case, um, you know, you start off when, when you're an early stage company, you put up a website and it's almost more of a, a credibility piece. Like we exist, we are real, here's our presence. Um, and of course, ideally, everybody wants great SEO, right? Everyone wants to <clears throat> rank the top of the page for Google. But um, I understand it takes a bit of time, right? And and it's going to take some investment. And, and and what does the process look like from saying, okay, well, I've got a website and I'm and I exist and here's who I am and it's a placeholder almost to it becoming a functional, you know, real website that drives leads and brand presence and all those other good things? Yeah, great question. So um, I, I made reference already to keyword research. Uh, so that's a something that comes in very early on, which is essentially mapping out all the needs that your users have, which your you know, products and services help address, right? Uh, and, and so you really have to understand that very well because you're going to need to create pages around each of those need areas and, uh, and, and show how your products and services map to and help satisfy those needs. And some of the pages might be pure information to help users who are kind of at the top of the sales funnel, right? Um, and then some will be, um, uh, you know, for people that are very close to making that final decision and, and everything in between. And there's value in having content uh, on across your pages for each of those areas of where somebody is in their customer journey. Um, so, uh, and you need to m map and create content to meet, um, you know, all of those uh, and needs and address all of those needs. But that's one part of it. The other part of it is making sure that your site um, is crawlable by Google. In other words, Google can visit the pages, can discover all the pages on your website, um, and can interpret the content properly on all the pages. That, unfortunately, is not an automatic. There are things you have yep. to do to make sure that that happens. And, um, and that's the technical part of SEO. Um, and the way to think about this, I've now talked about two different pieces. The technical part of SEO is largely about um, essentially making sure that you're able to compete for ranking on search terms. It's a little bit like you know, entering the local billiards competition, you don't get to play unless you pay the entry fee. So that technical SEO is like paying that entry fee. But the keyword research and the content creation is the thing that allows you to win the tournament, right? And so those are the two major components that, that I think of, you know, kind of at a high level. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And how long would it typically take somebody, though, to go from being a relative nobody to, you know, having some kind of real presence on Google organically? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a question that uh, uh, brings up the classic SEO answer to every question, which is, it depends. Uh, but, <laughs> but to do my best cut at a general answer to it, um, you, you start doing some things and it might take three or six months before you begin to see, you know, some traffic coming in that, you know, is enough to attract your interest. Um, and then, you know, if you're really starting from ground zero and you have nothing currently, um, then, you know, you're looking at a year plus to really build a strong presence. But you can yeah. begin to grow, uh, uh, you know, grow that presence along the way. So it's not like you don't see any progress. But the thing to remember is you're contemplating whether or not you want to make this investment. Why would I do this? It's going to take me a year. I can buy Google ads today and, and, and you know, get visitors and conversions right away. And by the way, maybe you should buy Google ads today and do that. But the thing is, the Google ads has a high cost of sales, right? It, it's, a, it's a lot of investment in just buying the ads to get those conversions. And, and the Google ads market, just like any advertising market, tends to be competitive. So the, the achievable margin, you know, contribution margin, if you will, on those campaigns tends to be low because there's always going to be some player who's willing to, to drive profit to near zero um, in, you know, in such a market. Um, so um, whereas in SEO, um, once you've earned those rankings and the traffic begins to come in, um, you actually have no cost of sales. You have a sunk cost of effort, but that tends to be a lot less than the cost of sales. Um, and the margins tend to be an awful lot higher um, um, in SEO. So to, to finish my sales pitch with that, I'll just wrap up by pointing out that you don't want to allow your competition to be reaping in all that high margin business while you're living on low margin business, you, you, you kind of want to yeah. keep that a high margin business for yourself if you can. Yeah, that's, that's it's interesting. And it's, you know, I think for any of our listeners out there, um, you know, obviously there's lots of different channels for marketing and lead gen. And some of them, as you pointed out, Eric, are, are tactical and quick and, and others are more strategic. Um, you know, I think, you know, this idea of paid Google ads, is, they're very effective, but they're very much price driven, right? And it's it's a numbers game. And whereas, you know, certainly from my perspective, this, this idea around SEO is, it may be longer term, but you're actually building an asset. Yes. You know, it's not something you can just click your fingers and you've got Google rankings, right? You know, it's it, once it's built, it keeps paying and delivering. It's highly leveraged. It actually is valuable too, should you actually exit your business one day. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. And I can um, illustrate it with an example from one of the earlier uh, exits I participated in, which was a, uh, uh, an education lead gen uh, site that we, that we sold, um, you know, uh, earlier on in my life. And um, we, we, all of our leads that we were delivering to the schools that were receiving leads for students from us, um, were driven by organic search. And what I learned in the process is that the acquirers of those kinds of websites, they wouldn't even bother buying a website that was getting all of its leads from pay-per-click because they could stand up another one of those and slam a campaign on it quickly and, and, and they didn't actually see that as having being a great asset. But um, we were able to sell our uh, education lead gen website um, you know, for a, a, a decent multiple, because so much went into building the asset, to use your phrase, um, you know, building the asset up. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, I, I had a funny experience with an SEO company once. They, um, they do a lot of advertising here in Australia and promote themselves as the biggest and the best and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, on the phone with the sales consultant, he was telling me how good they are. And he said, look, God, we'll just, just go and do this search term, you know, have a, have a look. And, you know, you'll see, you'll see why we're so good type thing. And I did the search term and 
the only way, the only place they turned up on the first four pages of Google was in the paid ads. <laughs> And I thought, you, you've just completely killed yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, anyway, it was a great, great little insight. But uh, yeah. Um, so with Stone Temple, I mean, and, and you've mentioned the type of clients you work with. I think I've got a good handle on, on um, sort of at least broadly what you're trying to achieve for those clients. How do you typically engage? What was the model? You know, did, you're obviously professional services. Were there fixed fee engagements? Was there ongoing? Is, is, is SEO a recurring thing that you need to keep working on? I, how does that sort of work? Yeah, so um, we'll start with the last question first. SEO is a thing that you need to keep working on. Let's say you build your SEO up to the point where you're the number one player for organic search traffic in your market space. And that's great. And let's say you feel like there's fairly limited opportunities to grow. Um, it would take a long time to get there in nearly any market, but put that aside for the moment. If you stop, um, uh, what happens is your competition doesn't stop and they catch up to you and you'll erode your share after a while. So you do need to invest some effort to defend what you've already accomplished. Um, but again, the margin tends to be far higher than it is in, a, in an advertising model. Um, but to, to the other part of your question in terms of how we engaged with our clients, um, there were basically two models, two major models. One was a project model, and that might start with an audit. Um, and, and then the other model would be an ongoing model, which um, in, our, um, in, in the engagements we like best, it, those were about not just simply sustaining market share, but systematically growing it um, and helping them uh, grow their presence. So, so just to talk about those briefly, the audit, the model for that is you come in and we, we do a few things. We run a thing called a crawler to discover all the web pages on your site and do some automated analysis of them. We would look at your analytics. We would look at your Google search console account. Um, and then we would have one of our expert SEOs go through the website and find problems. And then we'd build a list of issues. This is sort of the technical SEO side of things so far, right? Um, that are holding back Google from you know, giving the most value in terms of organic search traffic to your website. Um, the other part of that would go into, if we were in fact trying to grow their business, that's where it goes into the keyword research and defining new content to be created or old content to be improved and to work on uh, growing traffic uh, uh, over time. So um, yeah. the ongoing engagements tended to be a lot more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, I'm going to ask you another question that, that has an answer of it depends. But, um, you know, for business owners that are listening and they're thinking, uh, about SEO as a real strategy going forward, you know, maybe they're already doing it and they want to improve it, or maybe they're starting out. I don't know, but what what perhaps you can give us a range even of what should a business owner typically expect to invest? Um, and we're not talking super large Fortune one hundred companies because that's going to be different, I would suggest. But you know, your typical small to medium enterprise, maybe they're turning over anything from a million to ten, twenty million bucks, but. Um, you know, for those sort of regular style businesses, is there a range or a budget that they would typically should be thinking about? Yeah, it, it's a fair question. Um, I'll explain where the it depends part of it comes from, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working with a company right now that has well over 50 million in revenue and it's largely driven by SEL. So you can have companies that are very SEO centric. But let's assume that that's not the case, and you have a um, you know a broad mix of uh, uh, ways that you sell, or, or um, you, know, you have your website, and you may have salespeople or a retail store front or whatever. Um, so um, you know you might be looking at uh, 10, 15 percent of your expense. Uh, line, um, you know, going into something like this. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a working number, but there are a lot of variables that really define the real answer for each business. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, great. So I might shift, shift gear here a little bit if I can. Um, you know, obviously you, you started Stone Temple Consulting um, and, and from what I can tell you, you know, ran it for over 20 years, which is a, which is a fantastic milestone. So, you know, congratulations on that for starters. Um, can you talk through a bit about the journey of growth in the business? And, you know, ultimately, I guess, you know, what size you got it to. But I'm also curious at what point in that journey you started to think about exiting and when, when, when did selling your business sort of come into the, to the framework? So, yeah, in terms of the, the journey, uh, so it was sort of something I, 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 I fell into in a sense because, like I said, Stone Temple Consulting was initially a business development consulting business. And then I, I had a, a friend of mine take over as a, um, interim CEO of a DVD e-tail site. Um, and he wanted me to help him with business development. And I um, uh, started trying to do that. And I don't know, two, three months into working uh, with the company, I came back and said, you know, there's this thing going on in search and maybe we ought to investigate that. It could be a really good fit for this business. So, you know, you know, learned all about SEO at that time and did some some optimization. And a year later, they were doing $3 million a year in sales um, just from search. And, and that's sort of when I scratched my head and said, hmm, maybe I should do some more of this. Um, and I kind of got into it. But, um, but it was initially, you know, the, the publishing companies, the education lead gen, but I was doing some consulting on SEO. Um, and then I had reasons to exit the uh, the publishing businesses and and not do any more with those. And um, uh, you know, the Stone Temple, the you know, the consulting business had grown to I don't know, maybe half a dozen people or so. Um, and you know, started to get very focused on it and set out on a campaign of um, developing visibility for the business which uh, involved uh, um, speaking on the, in the local, uh, sorry, the national conference circuit uh, all across the United States primarily. And so I'm saying national, I should be clear which national I mean, um, but, um, and doing research studies that answered really tough questions and getting a lot of visibility for the business and, and um, making it a, a really prominent name. And, and so that started to give us a lot more exposure. Uh, we were getting larger and larger clients. Um, uh, the company started to grow. Um, and, and so uh, we, we just got to a point where, um, you know, I, I was looking at it. I was, you know, I, you know, I'm over 60 now. I was over 60 at the time this started to go on in my brain, which was, you know, I, I don't want to be doing this when I'm 70, right? You know, so it's sort of the, yeah. the retirement thing looming was the particular driving factor for me. Um, otherwise, might have continued trying to grow it. Or, But there's also this thing about, you know, do you feel like with all of your business strengths and weaknesses, are you near your peak? And that's another big consideration in this conversation. And, you know... And, and if you're not near your peak um, and you have a chance to go to another stage, how much effort is required to get to that stage? Because you know, as businesses grow, they go through transitions where things have to change dramatically, right? You, you know, you, Five-person business is one thing, but a 25-person business is very different. And are you willing to go through the effort, push through the changes required to get to that next growth stage? And if you're not, or if you feel like you've truly peaked in, in other ways, um, then, yeah, you know, time to think about exiting. That's uh, a really, really great insight. It's, um, I appreciate you sharing that. It's, it is something that I've seen a fair bit of where I've had business owners 
um, in our core businesses exit advisory group, we do transactions, we do business valuations, we do exit planning, all that sort of stuff. But the amount of times that I've also had business owners ask me to do a valuation because they're thinking of exiting and then realizing that the number we've come up with is well below what they need. Yeah. And it's quite a dilemma for them. You know, do I, do I sell now because I actually do want to get out, but accept that I'm not going to get the money I want? Or do I double down, invest more time, money, effort, and work my butt off for the next three years while I change strategy and try to drive growth and, and improve my value? Right. And then um, the corollary of all of that, too, is if you do just want to get out in the situation that, that you've just outlined, um, does that mean you have to start something else and you have an idea, you know, where you could potentially grow something else and get the rest of the money that you want? And, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, ab absolutely. And, and look, you know. Let's be frank, though, startups are also hard, right? It's, um, you know, there's, it's that execution piece and getting traction. And, you know, I've been involved in numerous startups and I often laugh and keep saying I'm never doing another startup again. And then, of course, I find my next idea for another startup. But <laughs> I think <laughs> some of us can't avoid that or, or we, we can't help ourselves. But, um, but right. yeah, look, it is an interesting one, right? I mean, I think, I think what we're talking about here is, is an overarching question around the entrepreneur's journey and the business owner's life. And, and it's actually a question that goes beyond the kind of day-to-day, -day, you know, elements of doing business. It's, you know, I'm, and, and I don't want to get too woo-woo here on anybody, but I'm, I, I'm one of these people that believes that we're actually not born to do business. You're born to live your life. And right. I think your business should simply be a vehicle for delivering you the life you want. And so, you know, when I think, business owners start to ask those fundamental questions of themselves, sometimes it's pretty scary what they come up with. Sometimes there's a very big divergence between what they want and where reality sits, right? And, and I, guess, I guess the message, and certainly I'm getting this from, from yourself and, I'm, and I welcome your feedback on this, is don't wait to the last minute to ask those questions because you might need a little more runway to, to get where you want to go. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Do not wait to the last minute. You couldn't have said it better because, uh, you know, the market might be wrong. Right. You know, that's another thing to look at is, you know, are, are there decent premiums uh, taking place in the market at the moment? Uh, or, you know, is the demand in your area, you know, even though, you know, in the long run, it's going to be fine. Maybe it's in a you know, momentary uh, lull, and uh, it's like okay, yeah. let's let's wait that out and 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 hang on to it. Especially if you're in a situation where you're getting you know good cash flow out of the business and you can't quite get the exit you want, and you know enough good cash flow can be an exit too. So yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's interesting. You've reminded me of a, another guest we had on the show, um, Greg Alexander. He um, he had a professional services company. Um, sold it for $162 million, which, you know, I'm sure most people will get out of bed for. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, one of the pieces of advice he gave, which has stuck with me, and I've probably, you know, reiterated it numerous times now, is that every business owner needs to have two numbers in their head or understand two numbers. It's one is what is my business worth to me? And two, what is it worth to the market? Right. And And Greg's view was, if the number of what it's worth to the market is higher than your number, sell. Sell. Because the current market conditions will change. And tomorrow, the market might have a very different view on your business. So if, you're, if they're outperforming your needs and expectations and numbers, to grab the opportunity. And I've, I've always thought that was an interesting concept or perspective on things. So I, I don't know if you've got a view on that at all. Oh, no. I mean, I, I agree. And in fact, it, it factored very much... Uh, I'm going to put just a slightly different twist on it is when, when we were selling um, one of the uh, education lead gen businesses, um, the, the team from the potential acquirer came in and very carefully, you know, wanted details on all of our financials and the, uh, you know, and our EBITDA and, and you know, they're going to calculate a multiple off of that. And what they were trying to do is, is deal with this from the, what it was worth to us. And it was like, okay, 
we're not gonna, we're not playing this game this way. Is the you know the way we approach yeah. it? Because we're going to talk about what it's worth to you, the acquiring company. Uh, which, by the way, you're making four times as many dollars on these leads as we are. Um, so you know, based on the structure of uh, relationship, and and there's you're receiving a website. So there was you know you're not going to take any of the any debt that we might have, and I think we didn't have any anyway. But you know, so it's such a simple transaction. And we were able to, um, you know, win that argument, as it were, and, and it changed the picture of the exit price significantly. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about this sale sort of process. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about how the idea of selling sort of came about, and I guess the the core driver for you personally, which which is so so critical. Um, how did the process start? Can you talk us through this? Was there stages? How long did it take? You know, how did you find your buyer? All that sort of stuff. Yeah, so we we did uh, eventually settle on an investment banker um, uh, to work with who uh, did an offering uh, mem memorandum uh, and sought potential buyers and set up meetings. And, and so we went through a, a series of meetings. By the way, I should mention prior to this, we'd been getting, you know, inquiries for years with people that were yep. interested in buying us and we weren't ready. So we just ignored those. But when we were ready, we, we went and, and got some help. Um, it, it's a certain amount of expense with it, uh, but I think it's worthwhile because they can do things at scale in a way that you can never do while you're busy operating your business. So... Um, uh, and you know they we, we had I don't know half a dozen different meetings with potential um, buyers. A uh, few of those turned into offers. Some of them didn't. Um, and you know just one of them was more interesting to us, and and that's the way we went. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what you've just described is is a very very common experience from a lot of people I talk to. You know one of the one of the things we see a lot of is business owners are getting tapped on the shoulder by people making inquiries. And in a minority, a small minority of cases, those buyers, you know, turns into something serious and eventuates into, a, into an actual transaction. But um, what we've seemed to see is that so many business owners get sucked into these conversations and they end up, you know, getting a pro well i mean they get asked for so much information it costs time and they're in meetings and invariably what um we see happening is that they keep getting put through the buyer's process and they end up spending an enormous amount of time and effort um engaging these people often to after six nine twelve months down the track you know pretty much exposing every part of their business ultimately getting either lowballed or having the buyer walk away because they've had a change of strategy um and <laughs> So it's, it can be an enormously frustrating experience for business owners who already have a day job. <laughs> yeah. You know, they are trying to run their company, right? It's, um, so it can, can be quite painful. So um, clearly you had a similar experience in terms of being contacted, but, but um, you, you know, you hired these consultants to, to help, I guess, run that process and provide the, the as you said, the scale and the, the sort of detail around it. W what, how long did that process sort of take from you appointing the banker to, you know, going through finding the buyers, negotiation, settlement, you've finally been paid? So uh, I want to say that it was maybe nine months uh, yep. overall process. Uh, um, putting together the operating memorandum was, was a lot of work, uh, but they gave us a structure to work with and, and that's helpful because you don't have to think all that through. Um, yeah. You know, as intelligent business people, we might intuit, you know, what the right structure should be. But it's so much better to start with, okay, just do this. And, yeah. and so, um, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it was a, a, a few months before we had the first meetings and, um, and then it was just, you know, took a few months from there to find um, uh, the right buyer. Yeah. And, and, and look, other than obviously 
them offering an agreeable price to you. Can you help us understand how do you define what is the right buyer? Like what were some of the things that went through your head that differentiated the eventual acquirer versus other other acquirers? Yeah, so the, there's several things uh, that were components of this. Um, um, you know, one is that um, in Stone Temple Consulting, uh, my wife was the COO slash CFO, and she wanted to retire. So, um, and then there's the price, obviously. I mean, that was first, but then, you know, her wanting to retire. And then also, what would it look like? Like, what were the expectations of me post-acquisition? And, you know, what was the culture like? And was the company, and we were very concerned about this, was the company going to, you know, essentially be able to continue with, under the auspices of the, the new owner? I mean, absorbed in for sure, but... Um, so, and what were the working conditions going to be like? And was all that going to be palatable? And what do the non-compete restrictions look like is another one. Um, uh, you know, so these are all, um, elements of, of the story that you have to look at. It, it isn't just, you got the price, but there's other things that come with that price. And can you live with those also? Yeah, that's that's interesting, and I want to. I, I'd like to get to deal structure in a, in a second. Um, but you mentioned um, non competes. I'm, I'm curious. Did you have um, an idea of what you wanted to do afterward? Did you have a new business idea? Did you want to break? What was the What was the plan? It, well, in my case, I knew that uh, upon uh, uh, completing uh, my um, you know initial term that I was committing to with the acquisition. Um, that uh, um, there would still be some level of restriction. and um, But what I wanted to be able to do was um, just do digital marketing and SEO stuff and have a way to do that. And, uh, and while I can't get into the specifics of what uh, restrictions are or anything like that, um, um, you know, it's a, a reasonable arrangement that works for both of us. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Um, I, I always find, you know, pe people, sometimes they're thinking of retiring. Sometimes they're just so keen to get on to their next thing, which is non-compete. I mean, most, well, look, frankly, I wouldn't work with business owners who are looking to do something untoward, but it's sometimes they've just got that burning thing they want to go and do. And it's, you know, it's quite exciting. They want to invest in something new. So it's, yeah, it can be quite interesting. But um, j just back to the, the sort of the, the transaction, though. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned EBITDAs and multiples and stuff like that before, like without without going into the exact um, scenario for your um, deal, how are businesses like Stone Temple Consulting usually traded? Like, is it a multiple of EBITDA? What sort of ranges would you, do, do companies out there typically expect or should they expect? Well, so consulting firms, um, uh, you know, and services firms that you know that's similar to consulting and structure, um, you know, generally speaking, don't get large multiples. You know, software companies or SaaS companies, uh, you know, they get you know very large multiples in some cases. So you, know, you can look at, uh, uh, I mean, you, you don't even get two x. I'll put it that way, uh, and you know, one x or one x plus is. Uh, sort of what a consulting company does, you know, in terms of, yep. uh, and that's that's what you would expect uh, out of all that, and that's, um, and, and you can do for people who are interested, you can do the digging in Google and find examples of these kinds of things yep. and, and work out, and you'll see that the the multiple ranges that just vary so widely, um, and it really has something to do with what's the natural scalability of your business. So consulting companies are scaled around the number of people you're able to effectively hire and manage and then employ, you know, in consulting engagements. And, uh, and so it doesn't scale the same way as a SaaS company, which can go from, you know, 1,000 users to 100,000 users with much more modest changes in infrastructure than a consulting company can. So, um, yeah. so that's kind of the range right there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, most deal structures that we see will have 
consideration paid in one of one, two, or three, or you know, all of these three buckets. You know, there's often cash up, up front. There might be a deferred component that's sort of not at risk. You know, in other words, we'll just pay you an incremental amount each year for the next two or three years, whatever it might be. And then, of course, the third bucket is potentially an earnout that requires KPIs. Yeah, you know, without getting into specifics, did you did you touch you know a few of those different buckets? What what broadly did your deal look like? Did you have an earn out that sort of stuff? Sure. So you know, again, I'm going to, have to stay away from the specific deal terms. Uh, so, sure. um, but there, were, what I think I can comfortably say is that you know there was certainly uh, a payment up front. Uh, there was a substantive piece of the total. Uh, but there was a, a material deferred uh, uh, payment structure as well. Um, and it makes sense from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the buyer to do such a thing. It, it provides a lot of risk management uh, type of assets. And, and the acquired uh, team has some incentive to, to keep working and delivering against the business while they figure out how to integrate it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and did you have to stick around for a minimum period for that transition? Uh, yes, I did. So uh, I did actually stay an additional uh, three years with uh, with the company. And by the way, yeah, okay. uh, uh, the acquirer, I can say who they are, a company called Proficient, uh, great company. I'm still doing some, some consulting work with them and helping them in some areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was a good experience. Yeah, that's great. And great that it was a good outcome. I mean, I think time and time again, we hear on this show how important it is to find the right kind of buyer. And that's not necessarily, it's not all about money. It's not all about them paying the right valuation. I mean, you know, clearly paying enough is is just the ticket to the dance. Um, often the, the good fit sort of comes in around values and culture and, and that kind of fit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, you know, one year, two year, three years, whatever time you might have to stay on, if 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 you in fact do have to stay on, can turn into a really long time. <laughs> if, if, you know, indeed, you know, indeed. The people or the culture or whatever, it, it can be painful. And yeah, yeah. I've I've had guests on this show, num a number of them actually, that have actually walked away from their own out because they just said they hated it. They didn't yeah. like the culture. It wasn't a fit. They they really were so opposed to being there that they just said, I'd rather not take the money, <laughs> which I thought is an extreme example. And it's horrible that it obviously happened, but it's it's a great warning for business owners who are thinking about this trip and, and thinking about this journey and, and how to engage with prospective buyers. So Yeah, well, um, I mean, the, the follow-up point to that is um, if that's a possibility in the deal you're looking at, then it means you can't include any sort of deferred compensation as part of what you're getting paid. Because yeah. if you and that might kill the deal, right? Because the buyer may not proceed. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, that's awesome, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's such a personal journey going through a business transaction like this, particularly when you're the founder and you've spent so much time in it. So it's, um, you know, obviously can be a deeply, deeply personal thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? So what, what are you doing these days? Where, where has this journey led you to? So, um, well, uh, I played 18 holes of golf today. Uh, so, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, uh, partial retirement um, and working roughly half time. Uh, uh, so I work about 20 hours a week, which, by the way, when I was, when I was working, it was 60 hours a week. So I could argue that that's one third time. Uh, but I'm also spending some time working on the fourth edition of The Art of SEO, uh, the book that uh, I co-authored with uh, Stefan Spencer and Jesse Stricciola. The, la the last prior edition um, uh, was released in 2015, um, and that's a little too long. So we're hoping that the book will come out later this year. <laughs> you just reminded me of my MBA. The first subject I did was marketing. And funnily enough, they didn't even talk about social media in it at the time. So by the time I got to the end of my MBA, the marketing module was already completely out of date. <laughs> so I guess, I guess SEO is always evolving as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, cool. Well, look, I'll certainly keep an eye out for the uh, the updated version, and um, you know when it's ready, please let us know because we'll we'll add some links to the um, back to the show notes and and try to let sure. people know where they can find it. So, um, so yeah, um, Eric, I'm I'm going to ask you in a minute. Maybe if I can put you on the spot a little bit and just sort of start ask you from with all your wealth of experience in marketing and SEO and and helping business owners out there. You know, I don't know if there's one tip that you might like to leave our audience with. Um, but b- b- before I ask you for that answer, it's, um, are, are you happy for people to reach out and contact you? And, and if so, well, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, yeah, no, yes. Happy to have people reach out and contact me. Uh, uh, certainly they can, uh, ping me at my uh, Twitter handle, uh, at stone temple, uh, or linkedin.com slash Ian slash Eric Enga, uh, probably the easiest ways to do it. Uh, if they do reach out either of those places, please mention um, this podcast uh, so I can make the connection because, I mean, I get a lot of such requests and I only accept those that, you know, there's a specific relevant um, piece to it. And, but I'd be happy to connect with anybody um, in either of those two places. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, once again, thank you for your generosity. I think it's um, I think it's great. And, you know, there may well be some questions. So um, um, we'll, we'll put some links there again in the show notes to your LinkedIn profile and your Twitter account. So we'll, we'll make sure people know how to find you if they'd like to reach out. Um, yeah. So, um, Eric, I really do appreciate you coming on the show. I mean, is there can I can I put you on the spot and ask if, if you know, is there one parting tip that you might uh, like to share with the audience before we wrap up? So I'm, I, I'm going to, in fact, if it's all right with you, I'm going to generalize a little bit because I think where I see a lot of business owners get hung up is that they are doing a lot of great things in their business, but they haven't truly identified what makes them unique and what aspect of how they approach things uh, makes them unique. And, um, you know, at Stone Temple, what we did is we, we get really branded around being the ones who uh, would try to do things the way Google wanted us to do things. So we were um, not ever trying to trick or manipulate Google or any, you know any aspect of that. And back in the day when we first started doing that, that was kind of not the norm. So we we stood out and we were a loud voice for that um, in a lot of different ways. But that was the thing that we did that made us very unique. And for that reason, um, there were people that just needed to work with us because they saw that unique aspect of, uh, of our business. Um, so, you know, I, I think understanding what it is that makes you special and unique in your business is the best thing you can do to grow your business. And it's the best thing you can do to make your business worth buying. Yeah, great, great advice, and I and I think obviously if you've really articulated that well, that's your content, right? That's what you're talking about. That's the stuff that differentiates. It's um, yeah, that's a, a brilliant tip, um, Eric. Th- thank you once again for coming on the show. You've been very generous with your time and and sharing your story. I've really enjoyed it. I've certainly written down a few tips while we've been going. So um, look, um, you know, once again, really, really appreciate uh, you, you making the time to talk to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Simon. I, I enjoyed it.